While Washington is buzzing about the release of the memo, President Trump paid a visit to a U.S. Customs and Border Protection facility in Northern Virginia on Friday. There, the president reiterated the need for a, quote, real wall. He singled out El Salvador, Guatemala, and Mexico for not blocking the flow of illegal drugs into the U.S. He also called on Democrats to make a deal regarding DACA. CBSN political contributor and political reporter for The Guardian, Sabrina Siddiqui, is in Washington and joins me now. Hi, Sabrina. The president also said Friday that he doesn't think Democrats want to take care of DACA recipients. The White House had planned to reach an immigration deal this week before government funding runs out. But how realistic is that at this point? It doesn't seem like anyone's focusing on that at the moment. Well, I think certainly the appetite for a deal has diminished on Capitol Hill, especially among Democrats who do not believe uh, that this president is sufficiently committed to enacting uh, protections for dreamers into law. Uh, when I've spoken with some of the Democrats on Capitol Hill, they say that they are supportive of some border security measures as part of a DACA fix. Uh, but then the question is, at what cost uh, will this president be willing uh, to sign a replacement for DACA? And he's not just asking for funding for the wall uh, or some uh, tightening up of border security. He is also seeking drastic changes to the immigration system. So this end of quote-unquote chain migration, which is effectively saying uh, scaling back family reunification visas. He's also seeking to cut back legal immigration. And so these are some of the changes that Democrats do not believe belong in, uh, in these negotiations. And frankly, there are some Republicans who've said the more you try to do, the harder it becomes. We already saw that, of course, with comprehensive immigration reform and its failure in 2013. And so, Sabrina, where do we stand on a plan to fund the government right now? And are we at risk of another their shutdown. Certainly, it, it seems all the more likely when you look at uh, just how little communication there is uh, between the two parties in Washington. Of course, you've had now uh, more uh, news around the investigation into Russia distracting uh, from talks to fund the government uh, on this new deadline uh, that they established um, of uh, February 8th. And so the question uh, is really whether or not Democrats are again going to come uh, forth and say, we won't support any spending bill that does not include uh, protections for dreamers. And would they have the vote? to hold the line like they did uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, I'm not sure that they necessarily will, um, uh, in part because uh, there's no, t there's no um, indication that they'd be any more likely to get a deal on immigration uh, this time around than uh, a few weeks ago. If anything, as, as we just talked about, uh, there seems to be even less likelihood of that happening. Um, but then the, the, the question becomes, what else what will be some of the sticking points as they try to craft a longer-term spending bill? Or, or are they going to have to move yet another short-term measure, which would also draw opposition not just from Democrats, but also conservatives. Sure. And Sabrina, now going back to the memo, House Speaker Paul Ryan has said this memo doesn't undermine the special counsel's investigation. But don't all roads lead to Robert Mueller when it comes to Russian election meddling? It's interesting because House Speaker Paul Ryan sa uh, said that. You also saw Trey Gowdy uh, make a similar uh, statement. And, and Trey Gowdy was the one who had stepped in to oversee the House Intelligence Committee's investigation into Russia when uh, Devin Nunes, who's the author of this memo, was forced to step aside uh, due to some uh, improper behavior involving his overseeing of, of the inquiry. So I think the challenge with that uh, with line uh, is that the president and some Republicans on Capitol Hill, such as Devin Nunes and supporters of the president, are using this memo for precisely that, to undermine the investigation of the special counsel uh, and to discredit uh, the work of the FBI as it investigates Russian interference in the U.S. election and potential collusion between the Trump campaign and Moscow. But of course, Democrats say the memo cherry-picked information to benefit the president. What is not included in this memo and is another one in the works? Well, there's a great deal of focus on the dossier authored by a former British spy, Christopher Steele. Um, and some of that dossier was, of course, funded by the DNC and Hillary Clinton's campaign. Previously, the firm behind that, that funded the dossier was retained by a Republican client. But um, the Republican memo makes it seem as though uh, the origin of the surveillance that was approved of uh, Carter Page, then a former Trump campaign advisor, was through the dossier and that the dossier was really the basis uh, for 
for a lot of the actions that were taken uh, by investigators when it's just a part of the puzzle. There were other, um, there were there was other intelligence that was corroborated uh, by U.S. authorities uh, in terms of the communication between Trump associates and Moscow that also uh, paved the way for the warrant. And frankly, it's interesting because the, the the way in which this warrant was obtained is such a big part of this. Uh, they, the warrant was requested uh, in October, a month after Carter Page had already uh, left the Trump campaign. Um, the Trump campaign really tried to distance itself publicly from Carter Page. So now they're kind of turning around and saying, hey, you were spying on one of our own. But certainly <laughs> at this time, they considered him anything but one of their own. Uh, absolutely. Now, of course, the FBI strongly warned against the release of this memo. Former FBI Director James Comey tweeted its release wrecked the House Intel Committee and destroyed trust with the intelligence community. Going forward, how will this impact future investigations by congressional committees, do you think? Well, I think the biggest challenge here is, the, is that this is a, about a lot more than just uh, the Russia investigation. Uh, this really has to do with the politicization of the FBI and the Justice Department, which have historically been independent uh, and, and steered clear of the kind of politics that have cast a shadow uh, over the investigation and the special counsel's work. And I think that the, it's precedent setting in many ways because the implications here here are that it, there is some sort of bias when there is not evidence yet publicly of, of sufficient bias here um, and, and some sort of underlying notion then that, that, the, that the FBI is supposed to serve the president. Uh, you, we know that the president has demanded loyalty from top officials in the FBI and the, and the, and the Justice Department uh, when it comes to Russia. So at the, at the heart of this is really uh, th this um, notion that the FBI uh, is no longer um, separate from a lot of the politics and the partisanship uh, that prevail and, and loom over Washington. And so th there's, there's implications of that, not just um, moving forward in the Trump presidency, but also beyond. Absolutely. Uh, Sabrina Siddiqui, thank you for that.